Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, Devotions on this Friday morning. And of course, this is the day where Australians celebrate Australia Day. And again, all the debacle over one day and all this sort of thing that's going on today. <laughs> it's like, you know, happy Australia Day. Uh, yes, so I'm having devotions this morning, though. I'm, I'm probably not expecting too many people to jump on live this morning. Uh, seeing as probably many are uh, probably enjoying their holidays, maybe sleeping in, uh, maybe getting ready to head out with family today and have barbecues, whatever it is. But uh, enjoy your holiday. Carol, good morning. Tracy, good morning. So, uh, yes, uh, as always, being Friday, be in prayer for your services on Sunday. Pray for the presence of the Lord and that uh, God would meet with you. Brother Zach, good morning to you and uh, to Lauren as well. Uh, yes, so be, be in prayer for your services on Sunday. Pray for the uh, presence of the Lord. Pray for that you'd hear from God through the preaching of the word. Uh, pray for your preacher. Pray for your song leader. Pray for everything. Pray for everybody. Pray for everyone. All right. Keep it bathed in prayer. Bathed in prayer. All right. Let's go to Genesis 28 this morning. Genesis 28. You know, you Probably like many of you, uh, many of you watching today, you know, I, I've, I've been to some dreadful places. <laughs> I've, seen, I've seen some dreadful things. Uh, I've smelled some dreadful smells. I've probably eaten some dreadful things as well. But listen, guys, <laughs> not my wife's cooking, all right? Never say that your wife's cooking is dreadful. Otherwise, you'll be, uh, you'll be living on bread and water. Lucy, good morning. Um, but, you know, when you think about that, you know, it's like, oh, if I, if I was to sit here and, and go back and think about, you know, the dreadful places that I've been and dreadful jobs. Jean, good morning. Just, just you know... We think about. <laughs> I'm I'm purposing in my heart not to get political this morning when we're talking about this sort of thing. Um, but you know, there there there's no doubt that when we think about the word dreadful, nothing good comes to mind. You know that word dreadful, that's horrible. You know what I mean. So you know when you use the term dreadful, that that place was dreadful. Or that food was dreadful. That smell was dreadful. You know, we're not we're not thinking we're not thinking anything good about that, right? I want to go to Genesis twenty eight because Jacob uses the term dreadful, and uh, he uses it in in he doesn't use the term dreadful how we would interpret the word dreadful when uh, when when. Jacob uses the term dreadful. He's he's talking about uh, he's standing in awe. Hillary, good morning. Uh, he's starstruck. He he's shocked at the, the the glory that's manifested. He's recognizing the seriousness of something. All right. Genesis twenty eight is probably one of my favorite depictions of church. And Jacob is is he's he's sleeping. He's he's you know having a sleep. He's having a dream. We call it Jacob's ladder. He has this dream: angels descending, ascending, and all this sort of thing. And he's just having this phenomenal dream. And listen to what he says in verse sixteen. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep, and he said, "Surely the Lord is in this place, and I knew it not." And he was afraid and said, "How dreadful is this place!" This is none other but the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillows and set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel, but the name of that city was called Luz at the first. I, I love the application. I love how, for me, this pictures uh, a local New Testament church. But before we get into that, notice, well, I mean, let, let, let's, let's talk about that. He, he calls this place the house of God. I love that term, house of God. I hope, everyone's, I hope everyone's praying and readying themselves to go to the house of God on Sunday. Um, when you think about a house, it's where people dwell. And we know that, according to Scripture, God is, is omnipresent. He's everywhere. And, and you can't contain God necessarily no you can't you can't contain god to one little place god's bigger than that 
All right. But we do know that when you read the scripture, there are certain places that he placed his blessing on. The temple being one of those. The tabernacle was one, obviously. Uh, Marie, good morning. But then when, they, when Solomon built the temple, that was a place where God put his seal of approval. That was a place where, where, where God said, right, I, I'm happy to dwell here. Okay. And the other place that he's happy to dwell in is you, of course, because you are the tabernacle. You are the house of God. He dwells within you. You're his house. This is why we've got to do housekeeping. This is why we've got to make sure that our lives are, 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 are right before God, right? We're, we're walking and living what we call uprightly, okay? A way we know that is through the scripture when the word is preached. We know that when we read the Bible or when the Bible is preached, if there's some things that we need to do some housekeeping about. Why is that important? Well, it's because it's where God dwells. There was a time, I believe it's in the book of I think it's either Deuteronomy or Numbers. It might be Numbers. God was talking about Israel. He said, I, I'm not going to be in the midst of your camp because it's filthy, it's dirty. They were actually defecating in the camp instead of going out of the camp, digging a hole and doing their business outside. They were doing that. He's, and God said, I'm not walking through that. So there are places where God has his blessing, but then there's places where God says, no, I don't want anything to do with that. Now, I, I, I want God's blessing upon my home. I want God's blessing upon me. And I want God's blessing upon the house of God, our local church. And I hope you want the same for your local church. I love the term house of God. And the term house of God is a term used for the local New Testament church. As a matter of fact, let me read this scripture to you in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. Paul talking to Timothy, who's dwelling at the church. He's at Ephesus. He's at the church at Ephesus, right? He says, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God. Notice the first thing, Judy, good morning. He's saying, I'm writing this so that you know how to behave in the house of God. There is a way that we ought to behave in God's house. And then he says this, the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. This is in con uh, conjunction with the local church at Ephesus. The local church at Ephesus, Paul was likening to the house of God, which is the church of the living God. And, and I'll tell you a way that you know that God is in a, in a place or in a church is that there's life there. You can't have the living God in something and not have life. That's why you have life because God dwells in you. The life of God is in you. You know, there's a lot of places today that have the name church or the title church, but there's no life there. They're trying to manufacture that life. They're trying to manipulate that life. You don't have to manufacture any kind of life if the living God is present in a local New Testament church. God is life. God is love. Everything about God that he is will be, uh, will be replicated in that church. So here we see that the New Testament church is likened to the house of God, the church of the living God. It's, a, it's an important place. Now, notice something back in Genesis 28, what, what Jacob does. He takes... Uh, he takes a bottle of oil, all right? He takes a bottle of oil and he pours oil upon the top of it. What he's doing is he's actually anointing this place. He's setting it apart for a specific thing. That's why it's called Bethel, the house of God. Because he says, surely God is in this place. The presence of God is here. The presence of the Lord is here. And so it's, listen, a church is an anointed place where God is. Now, as I said, not every church has the presence of God. As a matter of fact, for us at Open Door, as we, as we progress through Revelation, you get to the church at Laodicea. Where is Jesus Christ in relation to the church at Laodicea? He's on the outside. He's not on the inside. So that church did not have the life of Jesus Christ in it itself. Though Jesus referred to it as his church, didn't have his life. He was on the outside. So a local New Testament church is an important place for the Lord because he anointed the place. 
It's a very important place. It's set aside. It's set apart. I get bothered. I still get bothered by people who say, I don't need to go to church to worship, which, which is a true statement. You don't go to church to worship. You can worship the Lord every day of the week. But what they are doing is, firstly, they're saying some things out of ignorance of the scriptures as far as how important the Lord sees his church. Right? It's a very important, it's an anointed place. It's set apart. It has God's seal of approval on it. It's the place where saints come together. It's the place where the flock is fed the word of God. Now, you can read your Bible at home, but you have to agree with me that there are certain places in the Bible where, where, where the apostles, the pastors were instructed to feed the flock of God. So there are some things that you're going to get through the preaching of the word in church that you won't necessarily get outside in your own Bible reading. I'm not saying that the pastor is any better than anybody else, but God feeds his flock corporately when they come together. It's feeding time. That's important. There's a lot of starving Christians out there because they are missing out on some, uh, some nutrients that they need that they're not getting because they're not in the house of God. They're not in church. And so therefore, when we think about Jacob, when he says, how dreadful is this place? He's saying, how serious is this place? And why was he standing? Why was he in awe? Why was he in reverence? Why was he afraid? Because the presence of God was there. And maybe that's why some Christians don't want to go to church, because they don't want to experience the presence of God. Because though I love to shout and praise God, there are times, brethren, when the presence of God, you just, you just stand or you sit in awe of God's presence. It's a, it's a serious place. Now, I want to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 11 for a moment. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Again, just to remind us about some things here. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, because as I said, there are some who say, well, you know, the church is not a building. It's made up of people. And I would agree with that statement because we're, we're lively stones, right? But again, you've got to have a look at the scripture. The church is the people. But let me just say something about that according to scripture, right? The church, the people of the church when they come together. Today, if I sit in my office on my own doing some work in preparation for Sunday, I'm not the church. The church, now listen carefully. The church is the church when it comes together. That's why I don't believe in a universal mystical church, because the church is local. It's visible. It's tangible. All right. Listen, then, if you don't agree with me, listen to what the apostle said to the church at, uh, at Corinth. He says in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 17, Now, in this that I declare unto you, I praise you not, that ye come together, not for the better, but for the worse. For first of all, when ye come together in the church, when you come together as the church, the church is not the church when it's separated. That's not a body. That's, that's dismemberment. <laughs> right? It's like, you know, the church is a church when it comes together. That's why in COVID, when churches couldn't meet, everyone's like, oh, you know, let's have... Uh... Now, I have different, maybe a different view on the Lord's Supper than many, but, oh, you know, let's have, uh, let's have the Lord's Supper. You can come to church, grab your stuff, go home, and we'll do it online, all this sort of stuff. We never had the Lord's Supper while, while churches weren't allowed to assemble. Because you have the Lord's Supper when you come together. right? That's when the church is the church, when they come together. Again, that's why I don't agree with universalism, the universal church. Now watch this. So the church is not the church until it comes together. Now look at verse num number 20. When you come together, therefore, into one place. So a location is very important. Oh, the church is not bricks and mortar. The church is not a building. No, but a building is important. A locality is very important. A location is important because it's where the church comes. When you come together in the church, when you come together into one place, <laughs> so important. I mean, how can we not understand that? So this place, the house of God, the local church, is a very important place. It's anointed of the Lord for a specific use. That's what to be anointed means to be set apart. Sanctified is the same word. What is, what is a building? Let's talk building for a moment, location. What is a building set apart for? 
Now, we had opened all. We ran a place, the, the Caboolture Bridge Club. And, uh, you know, from uh, Monday through to Saturday, it's a bridge club. People go there and play their bridge, you know what I mean? But on Sunday, it's set apart for specific use. It's set apart for the church to come together into one place to corporately worship, to corporately rejoice, to corporately fellowship, and to corporately hear from God, Lord willing, through the preaching of the word, to be fed the word of God. And that's so important when you come together in the church, when you come together into one place. Let's go a few chapters on to chapter 14 for a minute as Paul is talking about prophesying or preaching. And it says in verse 25, And thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest, talking about people that come into the church, right? Talk about prophesying. And he says this, And so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you, right? Of a truth. God is here. God, The presence of God is in this place. This is what he's saying. Right? So when we come together in the church into one place, we want the presence of the Lord there. And we too should say along with Jacob, how dreadful is this place? Not in the, not in the sense of how the world thinks dreadful is. Oh, how horrible. No, we, how, we stand in awe. We stand in reverence. We sta- this is serious business. We've come together as a body of believers centered, uh, with Christ as our central figure. We're, we're focusing on him because Sunday is all about Jesus for the church. All right? Well, today in Australia, it's all about Australia Day. You know what I mean? He's going to fussing and fighting about a day and a date and changing times and all this sort of stuff, whatever, you know. How wonderful is Australia? But, you know, when you think about, when you think about the local New Testament church, I'm going to say that, the, that God's house is far more important, okay? We take today, we're going to revel in today, we're going to enjoy today, fireworks, this and that, and all this sort of stuff, and celebrations are going on. What are we going to do when we come to church? Are we going to drag ourselves to church? You know, oh man, I've had a heavy weekend. Oh man, all this sort of stuff. Or are we going to come to celebrate? Are we going to come to rejoice? Are we going to come to stand in awe of a, of a living saviour? Are we going to raise our hands in praise and worship to an almighty God? Are we going to say, yes, God, you're in this place. This is an anointed place. You are here. We praise you for your presence. You know what I mean? Like, let's, let's, let's think about this for a moment. How serious do you take the house of God? How serious do you take it? Let me just leave you with this. Let me, let, let's go back to Genesis. I want to talk about the sadness, the sadness of this place. And I say sadness because when you read it, it's like, wow, how many people could identify, do you think, <laughs> when they go to church, right? He says in verse 16, Jacob awaked out of his sleep and he said, surely the Lord is in this place. And I knew it not. How sad is that? How sad is to be in a place where the Lord is and not recognize the presence of the Lord? I I want to be where the Lord is. I want to be where the Lord is. I covet that. I'm jealous of that. I, I don't know about you, I try and work hard to make sure that, that that is, for us as a church, the place. You know what I mean? I, I want the Lord's presence there. Brother Randy, good morning. I want the Lord's presence there. I, 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 I'm very serious about that. I, I want people when they come into church, saved or lost, I want people when they come into church to say, wow, look, there's something different about this place. There's life, there's love, there's, there's smiling faces, there's a welcoming handshake, there's all of this sort of stuff. This is different than any other place that I've been to before. <laughs> you know what I mean? That's, that's what I want. But notice something, he says, the Lord is in this place and I knew it not. It still amazes me today, and, and, and I've been ministering for a while, not as long as uh, Brother Randy Perkins. Brother Randy Perkins has been ministering for the Lord for a, for a while now. But in the years that I've been ministering, it, it amazes me in the churches that I've pastored and the churches that I've, that I've started, where people come and they say, oh, the Lord led us here. Oh, that's really good. 
and and they enjoy it. They they they're just they're enjoying the singing, the worship. They they wow, they're hearing from the Lord. Man, God spoke to my heart and all this sort of stuff. And 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 there's just like there seems to be this this reviving that these people are having when they when they're coming to and it's such a good thing. And then a couple of months later, they're gone. What? What? I thought you know. What's going on? It, it, I've seen it happen time and time again, and I wish I had a definitive answer as to why people that come to church and recognize that the Lord, surely the Lord is in this place, and next minute they're gone. Why would you not want to stay where the Lord is? I, 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 when we started Open Door, we had a, uh, a gentleman and his, his wife come along, and he was watching on Facebook for a while, and enjoyed what he was hearing, came to church and 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 he was just he was one of these people that's just so excited and he was showing me in his notebook. The last time he took any set of notes from any meeting was back in the late nineties and he hadn't taken any notes. He'd been in a church, he'd not taken any notes. God had not been speaking to him and so on. and then he comes to open door and it's all changed. He starts writing stuff down, he's hearing from the Lord and then the next minute they're gone. I can't work that out. I can't work that out. Let me leave you with this verse, what John says in John or what Jesus says in John chapter 12. John chapter 12. You know, I take seriously a place where the Lord is. and I hope you do as well, and I'm sure you do. Because as I said, not every church has the presence of God there. Not every church has that. They're either fussing and fighting. There's either politics. There's either sin in the camp. Whatever it is, you, you name it, whatever, all right? So I take seriously when, when, when you know the presence of God is there. And I like what it says here in John chapter 12 and verse number 26. Jesus said this, If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servants be. Where I am. Where I am, that's where my servants will be. You see, we follow Jesus. All right? We don't follow a man. We, we love our preachers. We love our pastors. We pray for them. But Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. So ultimately, we're following the Lord. That's what a servant does. And, and he's my master. You know what I mean? He's my savior. But listen, if Jesus turned up in this world, in the flesh, right? And he was, I don't know, let's just say he was in New Zealand. Because who'd want to go to New Zealand? <laughs> but let's say Jesus was in Auckland. I reckon there would be so many... Uh, I reckon, Lindsay, good morning. I reckon there would be so many Christians who found out that, that Jesus Christ literally was over in Auckland. There'll be so many people that would want to go and be where he is. Well, spiritually speaking, brethren, do you know that Jesus assembles with his church on his day? Let's be in our place. Let's say, surely the Lord is in this place. And I knew it. Don't say, I knew it not. And I knew it. How dreadful is this place? How awesome is this place? How, how, wow, God is here. That's how we ought to approach it, brethren. That's how, we ought to, that's how we ought to approach the seriousness of the day. So when Jacob uses the term dreadful, he's not using it in the term that we would think about. Man, that was a dreadful meal. That was a dreadful smell as, as far as horrible. No, he's like, wow. He was like in awe. And he was, he was probably embarrassed that he didn't recognize the presence of the Lord in the first place. Sure, he's sure like, wow. And that's the difference, brethren. That's the difference. Oh, I tell you what, you know, we strive for the glory, for the Lord to manifest his glory on his day as we assemble. We have snippets of it. But one day, brethren, we're going to be in the very presence of his glory. Oh, and words fail to describe what that's going to be like. But it's going to be exciting. It's going to be, we're going to be awestruck at the presence of our Lord. And I pray that as we plan and prepare for Sunday, that we would go with an attitude of, Lord, I want you to be there. It's all about you. I want to focus on you. I want to magnify you. I want to hear from you. And, and just have that presence on Sunday. Amen. All right, let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you so much for today. Lord, may you lead us and guide us and bless us. Prepare our hearts and minds for Sunday. We desire to meet with you, Lord. And Lord, I pray that where you are, your saints, your servants will be there in Jesus' name. Amen.
All right, God bless you. For those who are in Australia, have a happy Australia Day with all your barbecues and everything. Thank you for joining all week. I appreciate that. Have a great day in the Lord. Look forward to being with our folks on Sunday. Lord willing, we'll be back on for devotions Monday morning. Until then, God bless. Goodbye for now.